Istanbul College of University. Um, this is the course for physiology. My name is Fazal Majibu. Most of you guys probably know me already, unless this is the first time you're attending lecture. Uh, today we will be starting the, the first week uh, of our lecture, of our lesson. If you need to get a hold of me, this is my email address that you can email me. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this is my phone number. You can message me at this number. Uh, the best thing to do is to come to my office hours uh, and speak to me face to face. If you need to get a hold of me, you can come to my my office. And uh, my office is actually, this is incorrect. My office is located, it is located in D block. Okay, however, it's located in room 304. Okay, so 304 in D block. Uh, this is my office and pretty much you can come, um, I'm usually there uh, every day. Uh, I get out there early in the, in the morning, uh, 8, 8, 8, 30 in the morning and I'm there until five o'clock. But again, I may not be necessarily in my office, maybe in a meeting or in a class. So always uh, message me and confirm with me before you come out. Make an appointment with me before you come to my office. Uh, again, I, I encourage you to come to me with any questions that you have. Do not wait until a day or two days or a week before your midterm or your final exam. Uh, I will not be able to help you at that point. I have uh, so much work and my office hours are extremely limited in the weeks before uh, the exams. So again, please come to me early, do not wait, do not delay. We will be starting this week's lecture on the entry system and we're going to be looking at uh, bones, uh, more specifically, uh, bone physiology. Uh, so we'll go over our objectives, which is, uh, uh, this is the second of uh, your physiology course, physiology two. So again, today we're, we're, going, to, we're going to be looking at uh, skin and its uh, its um, its components. We'll also be going over bone structure, uh, as well as uh, how bone is produced and it's uh, repaired. We'll be discussing a little bit of pathologies in both these things as well. So um, another term for this system is the integumentary system. Okay, so the integumentary system, when you're talking about the integument, we're talking about not just the skin, but everything else that we find in the skin as well. So that includes hair, our nails, as well as glands, such as your oil glands, as well as your sweat glands. These are all part of your integumentary system. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't understand or they take for granted is that the skin actually is the first one of the, the, the primary indicators of your overall health. If something's wrong, something's going on, something is abnormal in the inside of your body, the skin is going to be the first uh, organ, as you're going to learn that skin is an organ, that's going to let you know about that, that's going to alert you about uh, any abnormalities. For example, one of the things that um, may be an indicator that there's something not properly uh, taking place uh, or something's wrong on the inside of your body could be hair, okay? So uh, unusual hair growth, and, and that could be an indicator. Or, and again, um, it could be an unexpected loss of hair or brittleness, that's weakening of hair follicles. Uh, this should be a concern. Why? Because this could, uh, this could be an indicator that there may be a mild case of hormon hormonal imbalance, or it could be a uh, uh, a serious health problem like hypothyroidism. Uh, another thing that we may observe would be um, on the skin, freckles or sunspots. And this results from uh, too much exposure to the sun's harmful rays. So again, constant or excessive exposure can result in these freckles or sunspots on the skin. And these, both these things, they're a rather good measure for um, how much exposure of sun that we've had in our lifetime. So, uh, and this in turn could be a pretty good indicator uh, for what a person's risk level would be for skin cancer. 
So with that said, uh, sun exposure is uh, one of the factors for uh, skin cancer. So, you know, for example, moles that we have, or sometimes beauty marks that uh, some people think, they may not necessarily be beauty marks, but they could be a result from uh, sun damage. They could be cancers. In other words, they, could, they may be malignant. Um, another thing, for example, if you look at somebody's eyes and they're looking very puffy, maybe they're not getting enough sleep, okay, or bags underneath the eye. That could be due to too much work. So again, puffy eyelids, uh, or again, these bags under the, under the eyes, uh, that may be a sign of, of, of what's going on uh, physiologically, the person not being able to get enough sleep. It could be an, another indicator of stress levels being high. Um, sometimes you see people unexpectedly, they end up getting a couple of shades darker in their skin, uh, despite spending most of their time indoors. Uh, this individual, they may end up having, they may be suffering from uh, a disorder uh, called Addison's disease. This is when the adrenal cortex end up, uh, ends up having some, some level of damage. Uh, something else, another condition, uh, is uh, hyperhidrosis. We're just sweating a lot. Nothing wrong with this one, but again, we're just sweating too much. However, on the other hand, if you are excessively sweating, when you have increased sweating, um, this may be an indicator that you have, uh, again, another condition with your thyroid gland called hyperthyroidism, or again, this is just an overactive thyroid. Skin can also tell, can, can give you a sign that there may be an infection going on. So if you look at skin and it, it may appear very red or it may be warm or hot when you touch it, this may be a sign of infection. Aside from that, contusions or bruises is, uh, is also a sign that there's been some level of damage that's been taking place underneath the surface of your skin. So while bruises or contusions may appear uh, per in, in nature, in, in, in discoloration, uh, we also sometimes see yellow, okay, when the skin appears to be yellow. Um, this is called jaundice, and um, not only in the skin, but if you look at somebody's eyes, they may also appear to be, the white part of the eyes may appear to be yellow as well. Uh, this may be a sign of, of a possibly that individual may have hepatitis, uh, perhaps it could be uh, thalassemia, and, or it may even be pancreatic cancer. Um, again, if somebody has a fever, body temperature is high, skin is hot to the touch, there's an, possibly some type of an infection going on inside of the body. Uh, nail clubbing, okay, nail clubbing. This is when the nail curves under at the tip of the finger. And this may be an indicator of heart disease, perhaps inflammatory bowel disease, even lung disease or liver disease. Um, perhaps um, sometimes we see it with thyroid disease or, and even uh, with uh, actually even with HIV and AIDS. Um, if you see puffiness or redness near the cuticle, this could be an indication of perhaps a, a bacterial infection or perhaps a yeast infection. Um, there's also, speaking of nails, okay, or cuticles, there's also yellow nail syndrome. This is a very rare condition that ends up affecting fingernails as well as toenails. People who develop this condition, they can also have respiratory problems and lymphatic system problems with swelling in the lower parts of their body. Um, what else? Let's see. It should be good. All right, the functions of the, uh, the uh, integument system are many. Your skin, as I had mentioned, uh, it, is the, it is an organ. It's the largest organ of your body. If you were to check it out, it's about 22 square, me uh, it's 22 square feet uh, in area. The skin is also the first line of defense uh, against causing uh, organisms. The skin also is there to protect against UV rays, against ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Uh, in addition to that, the skin also helps to keep water inside, so it prevents dehydration. Skin is also responsible for the production of vitamin D, and vitamin D production, vitamin D is extremely important. 
not um, a lot of you a lot of us associate vitamin D with calcium uh, intake however aside from that vitamin D also pl it plays many roles and uh, one of them is also that it has a role in uh, immune uh, our in, in, uh, in that it supports our immune system uh, the skin also contains sensory receptors all right so these sensory receptors let us feel so whether it's pain or something walking uh, or somebody touching or temperature all this is responsible uh, due to the the uh, um, the the ability of the skin containing these sensory receptors which then ends up being connected to our central system which uh, brings us awareness of our environment now the skin also is responsible for excretion so it's uh, excreting or removing small amounts of waste waste products uh, through uh, through sweat through perspiration uh, if you for, for example if you eat too much garlic or too much uh, uh, onions for that matter yes you, you may have bad breath but also as you're sweating you will smell some of that uh, within your uh, within the, uh, uh, the perspiration um, also, if you look at uh, individuals, if you have any, if you experience individuals who have excessive amounts of alcohol, uh, they will remove alcohol. So again, all amounts of waste products and toxins are excreted through sweat as well. And again, these sweat glands are found within the skin. All right. Now, when you look at the slide over here, what we're looking at are the layers of skin. So over here, what we, uh, with, in, in this text, in this picture at least, they're showing that the skin has a makeup of uh, three layers. Uppermost layer called the epidermis, a mid layer called, called the dermis, and then uh, a layer called the fat, or it's called the hypodermis. Now the epidermis, this is the uppermost part of the skin, and it consists, it is made up of epithelial tissue. Now, this, the dermis, it is made up of connective tissue. This is also referred to as the true skin. Beneath that, we have this hypodermis. Again, hypo means below, dermis means below your true skin. So, the layer that's below hypo to the dermis, hypodermis. And this is made up of uh, subcutaneous, it's also referred, uh, sometimes we also call this subcutaneous tissue. And it's made up of loose connective tissue as well as adipose tissue or fat cells. So again, these are the three uh, components of skin. We have the epidermis, dermis, as well as the hypodermis. Now, um, when you look at the first layer, this is the connective tissue layer, the epidermis. It is made up of many, many different types of cells. Um, and these cells uh, are found in different areas of the epidermis. And, and uh, we'll be looking at that in a little bit more in detail. So, for example, uh, amongst those different types of cells, we have these keratinocytes, melanocytes, Merkel cells, and Langerhans cells. The keratinocytes, their job is to produce keratin. Keratin makes this, the, these cells a little bit harder, a little bit tougher. Uh, and it, it, so it coats them also, it makes them a little bit um, water resistant. Uh, that's another way to look at it. The melanocytes, on the other hand, they produce uh, a pigment called melanin. Okay? Melanin gives color. Melanin, uh, if you look, so here, if you look over here, this is a melanocyte over here. And the melanocyte is producing melanin. Melanin, as I said, again, it's a pigment, it produces color. It is brownish to black in, in nature. The amount of melanin uh, a cell will produce is most uh, constantly producing, is mostly genetic. So if you look at people that, some people are all the different skin colors that we see. Some people are like cheese white, okay? They are spinner. And then you look at other people, they are very dark, okay? Uh, like chocolate, okay? And so again, we have this, uh, wide range and then you have in between like myself I'm in the middle I'm, I'm light brown or brown um, why did I say light brown well in the in the winter months 
my skin is not as brown as they are, as it is in the summer months. In summer months, my skin gets a little bit more darker brown. So naturally, my my body produces a light brown uh, amount, uh, a moderate amount of uh, of melanin. However, the sun is a stimulus for the production of melanin. In other words, the sun stimulates melanocytes to produce more melanin. As more melanin is produced, the skin gets darker. So again, when people go out sunbathing, what they're doing is just stimulating these melanocytes from the sun to uh, increase the amount of melanin that get that, that's being produced. And this is what gives a tan. Now, with that said, the sun brings uh, uh, contains ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation Lead, may lead to cancer. So again, you don't want to go and lay down in the sun because it's not only going to increase your chance of cancer, but also it's going to cause uh, damage to the skin. Sun is horrible. It damages the skin. This is why it's extremely important to wear sunblock when we're going outside. Um, and also you want to limit the amount of exposure, especially during the summer months. Merkel cells, on the other hand, Merkel cells uh, are uh, a type of sense receptor cell. Uh, so they are responsible for sensation. And if you notice that they are found all the way in the bottom, just like the melanocytes are. Melanocytes and Merkel cells are found in the very bottom layer, this basal layer or basement membrane. Um, and we're going to discuss more about these layers um, in a bit. Additionally, we have uh, these antigen-presenting cells called these Langerhans cells. These cells are responsible. They help protect you. Uh, it's also believed that these cells may go and... Uh, destroy cells that have been damaged by the sun. So again, if there is a cell that's cancerous, these cells uh, have been shown to play a role in, uh, in, in, in killing them, essentially, or again, uh, or absorbing them. Also, so again, it has an immunologic function. It has a protective function. Now, when we look over here, um, this is all the different strata that we have. So this is a dermis, and all of this, if you look over here, this is all epidermis over here. So from here, all, all the yellow, everything that you see in yellow, going all the way up, all this is epidermis, okay? So this very first layer, okay, and that's, that's it. We're talking about a single cell layer thin. This is the stratum basale, okay, or, the, or, the, or the, uh, the basement membrane, okay? That's it. The very first layer, this is that basement membrane. And it's within the basement membrane, that we have the, um, the germ cells. So these cells are constantly producing new cells. As these cells are produced, they get pushed up. So today, this cell will give birth to a new cell, and it gets pushed over here. Um, later on, another cell gets produced, and that gets pushed over here. So the cell that was here today, now will go up there, and on and on and on. So again, the cell that gets produced over here, it will eventually come all the way to the top. And this journey going from here, from this basin, basin membrane, all the way to the top, it can take anywhere from seven to 10 days or perhaps a little bit longer. Um, so again, as I said, this basement um, membrane, this basement layer, this stratum basale, it's, about, it's one cell layer thin. Now, the next part is the stratum spinosium. Now, in the stratum spinosium, this is about between 8 to 10 cell layers thick, right? So as the cells are being pushed up, we have these keratinocytes that are over here, and they're secreting keratin. So these new cells that are coming up, they get surrounded by the keratin, and then they start the process of death. They start to die, all right? So again, remember, the cells are traveling upwards. Also, if you look over here, if you notice that, there's no blood vessels that we find within the epidermis. So where is the blood? Uh, where are the blood vessels located? They are found over here in the dermis. So the further away that you move up, the further away you are moving from the blood vessels. And remember, oxygen and nutrients are found in blood. So these base. This is why these basement, uh, the cells in the basement membrane are the germ cells because they have a constant supply. They have access to the blood. These cells do not. So though, as they start to move away from blood. As they lose access to nutrients, they will start to die, in addition to being covered with the keratinocytes. So, um, we find, we said we find these uh, 
the melanocytes are found in the basement in this, uh, the, the serum basale, as well as these Merkel cells. And if you look over here, these Merkel cells are connected to these sensory neurons. The nerve cells are found where? In the dermis, not in the uh, epidermis. Okay, the Merkel cells serve as a bridge between the uh, epidermis, between the upper layers and then the lower layers. So they will sense any change over here that's taking place here, and then they will send it to the sensory neurons, which then eventually connect to your uh, central nervous system, and then we are uh, brought uh, to consciousness of, uh, of sensation. Okay? So, moving up, what's next? Next we have this, uh, this stratum granulosum, and we find these lamellar granules found, found over here. The stratum uh, granulosum, this is anywhere between three to five cell layers Thin. And again, by the time the cells come over here, they are dead. So are dead cells over here. Okay. Now, the next layer we find in thick skin. So we're talking about our palms and the soles of our feet. Maybe two to three cell layers thick. We have the stratum. After that is the superficial layer, the very top layer. This is what we're touching. This is what you're putting makeup on. This is what you're putting moisturizers uh, on. This is the stratum. And this is 15 layers and greater. Okay. Uh, stratum corn corneum, the very top part of your skin. All right, so again, what do we have? Stratum basale, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidium, as well as the stratum corneum. All right, so as I had mentioned, the epidermis does not have any blood. Where is blood? The blood supply, as well as the nerve endings, they are found deep, they are found in the dermis, okay, as well as the the, the, the subcutaneous layer, uh, the, the fat layer, this is where they're going to be found. So, uh, in the dermis, again, we have the superficial and deep plexus. Uh, again, they are, um, so right over here, again, you can see the larger blood vessels being in the fat tissue. And then as you go up, as you get into the dermis, it ends up, they end up becoming smaller. Uh, lymphatic capillaries are also located over here as well. So again, in the, the dermis, we have now the hair follicles are located here. We have this, the oil glands, which are called sebaceous glands, being found here as well. We have the, um, what else, uh, the, the follicles. The hair follicles are also found in the dermis. Uh, we see there's sweat, sweat glands also that are found over here. So sweat glands as well as sebaceous glands. Remember, the oil glands are called the sebaceous glands, and then we have sweat glands over here. Here you can see the nerve endings also. Nerve cells, remember, they connect to the Merkel uh, cells in the epidermis. So, um, all right. Um, next, we see over here um, the, so yeah, over here, all deep down, we will have, uh, so actually, yeah, so when you look up over here, we see the, again, the hair follicles, they exit uh, the, uh, the epidermis and the oil glands are connected by the hair follicles so again oil comes out through where the, the hair follicles exit okay so remember sebaceous glands they exit through the hair follicles um, now when we have wound healing wound healing consists of uh, three stages there's inflammation proliferation and remodeling Inflammation is, so look over here. What are, what's going on over here? We have skin and some type of injury is taking place, all right? We have injury, we got tissue that's damaged. And when we look over here, we have both dermis uh, as well as epidermis that's involved. So naturally what's happening, blood vessels are, are damaged, now we start to bleed. So the first uh, the stage, what's happening is the inflammatory stage. At this point, we're having coagulation. In other words, we're gonna have a clot that forms. A, a formation of a fibrin, fibrin network. We're going to have an influx of inflammatory cells that's going to come to the area where the wound is taking place, not only to help stop the bleeding, but also to, to start the repair process, which is the next uh, part, this proliferation phase. So uh, over here, now we're starting to, to repair blood vessels, angiogenesis, fibroplasia, and also reepithelization is taking place. So we're building epithelial cells. We're starting to build more, uh, we're starting to build connective tissue. In other words, we're having um, uh, cells that are, that, that are coming over here to repair and build. 
And the remodeling uh, uh, phase, over here we're talking about you want to achieve strength, the tensile strength. So now we have connective tissue, a lot more connective tissue is being repaired, and we're having uh, scar tissue that's being formed over here. So we're having reorganization, degradation, and synthesis of this matrix, this extracellular matrix of the dermis. Um, and again, uh, you can see the, epi and the epidermis over here has been healed at this point. Now, um, when we have injury to the skin, we have a cut, some type of trauma that results, and there is a gap, a wound. If it is stitched properly and nicely with care and some... Um, cosmetic awareness, then what's going to end up happening is the aim is that you want to minimize the amount of scar that's forming. So if you're able to pull these gap as close together as possible and to reduce the amount of tension while you stitch it, uh, it theoretically should result in less scar tissue from forming. The wider the gap is, the more scar tissue is going to be needed, so that you'll have more scar. The less that the the smaller the gap is, there's going to be less scar tissue that gets uh, um, uh, added uh, to fill up the gap. Okay, so hopefully the, that kind of uh, explains why some people may end up getting a lot more scarring when they do not have their wound um, stitched up or sutured. All right. Now we move on to the skeletal system. So what, are the fu what is the function of the skeletal system? Uh, the skeletal system has a lot of functions. Now one of the things is that, it is that it provides a framework that supports the inner organs of the body. It, in other words, it, pr it will provide points for some of these organs to attach themselves onto. In addition to that, if you look in, in life, in the world around you, if you look at the president of a country or the mayor of a, of, of a city, they have a lot of protection, a lot of people protecting them, a lot of police, military that's protecting them. Uh, if you look at a motorcade, for example, for the president of the United States, uh, there are secret service agents in front, behind, and to the sides of it. Overhead, there may be even a jet that's, that's flying uh, over where the president uh, is going to be at, in the area that the president is at. So there's a lot of protection that's, uh, that's in place. Similarly, when we look at our body, if you look at our brain and spinal cord, it has 360 degree protection. If you look at our brain, from the top, from the bottom, from the sides, it's covered in bone, right? It's, it's being protected by the bone. So our cranial vault is protecting our bone, whereas in the case of the, of the spinal cord, we have our backbones, their vertebra, uh, which are, again, completely surrounding the spinal cord. The, um, Muscles attach themselves to the bones, right, by way of tendons. And then when the muscles contract, they pull the bones for us, which, which is how we end up having movement. Now, bones also store a lot of minerals inside, in, in addition to storing energy in the form of triglycerides. If you think about it when you get sick, you know, Think back to when you were a child. Your mother would probably have made you perhaps chicken soup. So what's she doing? She's taking maybe chicken leg or chicken thigh and she's boiling it in water for a long period of time. As she's doing that, what's happening is that the, the bone, as the temperature increases, as the water temperature increases, the bone starts to soften up. And as the bone is softening, it's liberating. In other words, it's releasing the contents uh, inside that bone that the bone is made up of. It's releasing the minerals from it. It's releasing the fat that's in it also. So this is why uh, as these minerals, calcium, zinc, uh, the fat that's, that you find within the bone, as all this is released, and again, you drink that soup, you get energy, your body gets what it needs uh, to repair itself, especially zinc, very important for, uh, for uh, uh, fighting infections. Bone is also where blood is produced. Your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets are produced by spongy bone or in the bone in, in, in the red bone marrow. Now let's look at the, the, the anatomy of a bone. Okay? And this is a long bone. So in this case over here, what we're looking at is a, a humerus, okay, which is the upper arm bone. 
This is the head of the humerus, and this humerus, this, at this point over here, is where it will articulate with the glenoid, glenoid cavity. Um, so, this part that's closest to the point of attachment to the trunk is the proximal end of the bone. And the part that's further away from the point of attachment to the trunk of the body is referred to as the distal portion of the bone. So you have your proximal and distal portions of the bone. And in the case of this bone, uh, this is called the epiphysis. And this long bone, this uh, humerus, has two epiphyses, or two epiph uh, epiphysi. We have a proximal and a distal epiphysis. So uh, the proximal epiph epiphysis, distal epiphysis. Between the proximal and distal epiphysis, we have this part over here, which is called the diaphysis. Within the diaphysis, we see that we have this medullary cavity. And within that medullary cavity, we have fat that's stored, or bone marrow, yellow marrow that is found over here. And this yellow marrow, it is triglyceride. This is energy. This is what gets released when you boil that chicken, uh, the chicken bone, when you're making, your mother's making that soup. This is the fatty part. And over here, all this stuff over here, this is where all the minerals are being liberated from. As that heat, water heat increases and the bone softens up, all these salts, they end up being released, they end up being liberated into the water and then you drink it. So, between the epiphysis, we have this uh, epiphyseal uh, plate over here. This is cartilage and this is what's allowing for the bone to grow during up until... Um, the age of between 18 to 21, maybe 23 in some people, but right around 18 to 21, most people, this is when this cartilage plate, it ends up fusing and it forms this epiphyseal line. Once this uh, epiphyseal line forms, there's no more cartilage. Now it's sealed. It's hard. It's, it's, a, it's a hard callus that's formed. It's bone, in other words. And what that means is that the bone is no longer going to grow. In other words, you're not going to get any, any more taller. Um, okay, so again, you find this in both your uh, the bones of your legs as well as the bones of your arms. So this is why you know your limbs grow. Okay, so this is the epiphyseal plate. All right, as far as bone marrow goes, there's two types. There's red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow produces blood cells and clotting factors that we find in, for example, in the long bones the humerus and femur. Also, if we find them in flat bones, such as your sternum, as well as ribs. In irregular bones, such as vertebra and pelvis, we also find them over here. Now, yellow bone marrow is what's storing the triglyceride. This is what's storing fat, okay? So red bone marrow, what is this? It's, it's producing blood. Yellow bone marrow, it is storing fat. And again, yellow bone marrow, you find in the medullary cavity of the long bones. As far as the structure of the bone goes, okay, uh, it's uh, bones will have, according to this slide, what's, what's over here, this is limited information, there's a lot more, but there's also, so the outer, there, there's an outermost layer that's wrapping out, that is wrapping around the, uh, the bone, which is called the periosteum. Remember, osti means bone, un means pertaining to, peri means around. So this is a layer that's around the bone, okay, around the bone periosteum, okay? And the outer part of the bone is compact. This is a hard, strong layer of bone. So again, um, we have blood vessels that are penetrating these compact bone. Um, we find, again, a very high amount of calcium and phosphorus, uh, that, that, that phosphate that's gonna be found over here that produces this uh, compact bone. Then we have the spongy bone, okay? Spongy bone, again, we're going to find them in flat bones, and then we're going to find them at the ends of long bones. And they have a lot of spaces in between them, so they're relatively lightweight, okay? Spongy bone is relatively light. Compact bone, hard, strong, and generally speaking, it's a little bit uh, heavier in, in weight. However, bones in general are not heavy. Bones are lightweight. We also have marrow cavity. The marrow cavity, again, we're going to find in long bones and uh, it's in the diaphysis of the long bones and this is where the fat is stored, okay, or where the, the yellow marrow is stor stored, the triglyceride is stored over here. 
Now, bone is made up of an organic matrix that's mostly strengthened by the deposits of these calcium salts. 90 to 95% of it is a collagen uh, fiber. And this fiber um, extends primarily along the lines of these uh, tensional forces. This collagen fiber is what gives the bone its tensile strength. In other words, it adds a degree of flexibility to the bone. When the bone is a slightly flexible, it actually makes it much more stronger. If a structure doesn't, does not have any flexibility, it's going to snap. But when it has a slight amount of bend to it, it is going to end up making it much stronger. Okay, so this is extremely important to understand. Giving uh, a structure, a, a, a certain degree of flexibility or a certain degree of tensile strength will increase its overall, st it makes it much more stronger and resilient to breakage. Crystalline salt deposits, uh, in the, uh, the, crys the crystalline salts deposited in the, ma in the matrix of the bone are made up of something called hydroxyapatite, okay? And it's, it's a mixture primarily of calcium and phosphate, okay? So hydroxyapatite, this is the, the, the salt deposition in, the, in bone, okay? All right, now when we're looking at uh, these collagen fibers of bone, right? Somewhat similar, you know, if you want to use imagination, they may look like those of tendons. Again, this is what gives it tensile strength. Calcium salts, they have a lot of compressional strength, okay? The collagen fiber, it has a lot of tensile strength, right? The salts, they end up giving it more compressional strength. So the uh, combination of those two, again, it makes bone very, very strong, all right? Now, as far as bone production goes, bone gets built by bone building cells that are called osteoblasts, okay? So the initial stage in bone production is done by the secretion of collagen molecules by these bone building cells, by these osteoblasts. Um, as these collagen molecules end up being secreted by these osteoblasts, uh, these collagen mo monomers, they'll start to polymerize to form these fibers, all right? And this results in the tissue becoming what we call an osteoid. Now, when this happens, this osteoblast ends up being surrounded by this matrix, this osteoid. And now we call it this osteocyte. Okay? So, again, what's going to happen is this osteoblast starts to secrete this collagen fiber, okay, these collagen molecules. These molecules, they start to polymerize, and they end up getting surrounded by it to form what we call this osteocyte, osteo, uh, osteoid, sorry. When this osteoid develops, these osteoblasts, they become trapped in this, by their surroundings. So once that happens, they're called an osteocyte, or in other words, they are now mature bone cells. So at this point, they were bone building cells. Now they are mature bone maintaining cells. Okay, so osteoblast, osteocyte. Um, so yeah, usually within a few days after this osteoid is this calcium salts, they begin to they start to precipitate on the surface of those fibers. Now, remodeling of the bone. Bone is continually being. Um, remodeled, okay? So let me, all right, so I want to give an example. In the United States, a lot of the buildings are made up of bricks. And uh, some of these buildings, as if you look in Chicago, they're very old, they're over 100 years old, 100, 120 years old, for example. So what happens? This is what they do over there. Over there, these buildings are made up of bricks. Now, if you look at bricks, you want to take one brick and you, you lay another brick on top of that. Well, what keeps the two bricks together? Well, what holds the two bricks together is cement. The bricks, they can last a very long time, 50, 60, 70, maybe 80, perhaps even longer. However, the cement, 
the cement gets worn out much, much sooner. The cement gets worn out maybe 10 years, 50, maybe not 10, perhaps 20, 25 years, uh, maybe even 30 years, all right? The cement gets old and it needs to get changed. So what ends up happening? We have masonry over there. Uh, they come out and they, they cut a hole. They, it's kind of like a drill and they cut out the cement and they pour in new cement between the, uh, between the bricks and it keeps the entire building nice and strong for hundreds of years, all right? This is called tuck pointing. So similarly, this concept takes place in, in our body as well, in bones. Bone is continually being deposited by osteoblasts. As it's continually being absorbed, so what ends up happening is it's continually being absorbed, it's being broken down by osteoclast and new bones being built by osteoblasts. Okay, so osteoclasts are, they're actually a type of, they're derived from, derived from white blood cells. Osteoclasts, they come and they chew away the own old bone matrix, which then osteoblasts, they come in and they build new bone matrix. Okay, so this keeps bone refresh. This is what remodeling is. This is why, again, if you don't end up having any type of trauma, again, for most people, we go through our entire lives without, any, without ha having any of our bones break down on us, right? Provided there's no disease, and again, we have a good nutrition. We'll be looking at that later on, later on in the lecture. What are some of the factors that are affecting bone growth? And there are many factors that affect bone growth. So if you look over here, nutrition is one of them. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is needed for absorption of calcium from the intestines. Uh, vitamin D also has, as I mentioned earlier, it has roles in our, uh, immu uh, our immune system also. It has uh, repercussions. Vitamin C is also necessary for synthesis of osteoblasts. Also, lots of hormones. Again, if you think back from uh, Physiology 1, growth hormone that's the anterior pituitary gland is needed to build bone. Thyroid hormones are also required for growth of all tissues of the body, including bone. We also have sex hormones that take place uh, that are needed for bone growth, such as estrogen and testosterone. Also, hormones that are related to the uh, homeostate, maintaining homeostasis of calcium are required. So if there's uh, any deficiencies or any interruptions in one of these hormones, it will affect uh, maintenance and growth of bone. All right, next we look at nerve signaling. Calcium is also needed for uh, nerve signaling. Nerve signaling. Uh, it appears that calcium uh, plays a role in the regulation of a lot of uh, aspects of cell division, okay? We're starting to have a lot of evidence uh, that is showing um, transient or local gradients of calcium contributing to different events that include nu the nuclear envelope breakdown and reformation in addition to the cleavage furrow formation as well as the growth uh, in addition to uh, the formation of the cell, uh, cell plate uh, formation. So calcium, as you know also that we looked at in physiology one, plays a role in muscle contraction. Calcium plays a role in neuron uh, uh, signaling as well as glands. Uh, so again, it, uh, signaling from uh, nerves to glands also. So again, uh, Calcium, in other words, you can think of it has a role in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the signaling process. And it is secreted by both glands as well as uh, neurons as well. Um, or again, it, it plays a role in the secretions of neurons and glands. Uh, calcium also has a role in uh, the formation of blood clot. It plays a key role in that we need that for coagulation to take place. All right, calcium metabolism, let's talk about that. The extracellular calcium ion concentration ends up being determined by many factors, 
which include the calcium absorption from the intestines, renal excretion of calcium from the kidneys, as well as uh, bone absorption uh, and bone release uh, of, um, of calcium. Each one of these things ends up being affected by hormones, and we're going to be looking at calcitonin, parathormone, as well as vitamin D. Um, calcitonin, this ends up, this is a hormone, okay? Um, it, main thing it's doing, calcitonin, is that it's decreasing blood calcium levels, okay? If calcitonin is decreasing blood, blood calcium level levels, then parathormone, it, <clears throat> excuse me, parathormone is going to be increasing uh, blood calcium levels. All right, so they have opposite effects. This is decreasing, this is gonna be increasing blood calcium levels. Um, yeah, so again, calcium, it's gonna be decreasing blood calcium levels. And again, it has a role in regulating calcium levels in, uh, by decreasing blood calcium levels. Uh, in our thyroid glands, we have these C cells that are producing calcitonin. Parathyroid hormone or parathormone, we find on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, four tiny glands. These are called the parathyroid glands. And these are the glands that are secreting parathormone. Okay, and uh, the job for parathormone is to increase the absorption of calcium in the gut and it reduces the excretion in our kidneys. Therefore, Blood calcium levels stay elevated. They say hi. If you're going to absorb more calcium from the gut, and you're not going to let uh, extra, uh, you're not going to allow for excess uh, calcium to exit through the kidneys, then calcium levels will stay high. So when you look at this slide over here, and you look at calcitonin, so calcitonin again, what is it doing? It's inhibiting calcium reabsorption. So if you're not gonna re uh, if you're gonna block the absorption of calcium, that means you're gonna be excreting it. So calcium levels decrease in the blood. Okay. If you're gonna promote depositing, if you're gonna be storing calcium into the bone, okay, then blood calcium levels will decrease. Okay. If you're gonna be taking, if you're gonna be blocking calcium from being absorbed from the intestines, the blood calcium level is gonna be low, okay? So these are the functions of calcium, right? These are uh, kidneys, bones, and intestines. When you look at it, it's, it affects on these three structures. This is how it leads to decreased blood calcium levels. Now, the opposite for parathyroid hormone, let's do the opposite thing, okay? If you're gonna enhance the absorption of calcium from the intestines, blood calcium level will increase. If you're gonna inhibit the excretion of calcium from the, uh, the, uh, the kidneys, blood calcium levels will increase, okay? If you're gonna increase the osteoclast activity of calcium from bone, in other words, you're breaking down bone matrix to liberate calcium, blood calcium levels will increase. Okay, again, this is the, are the effects of parathormone. And parathormone we find on the back of the thyroid gland, up the, on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland. We have these four tiny glands which are secreting parathormone. So when you look over here, again, um, we have to understand that vitamin D receptors have been reported to be found in many, many, many tissues of the body, including tissues of our, uh, including our immune system. We find it in, uh, uh, in the brain. We find it in heart, uh, pancreas, and even in intest intestines. So again, um, you know, it's suggesting that there's a role that it plays in these tissues. And uh, if we, you know, go take it a step further, you know, it can also explain its association with a wide variety of conditions such as type 
type 1 and type 2 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, as well as schizophrenia, uh, and even some cancers. Again, vitamin D plays lots of roles. Muscle function, blood, regu- um, blood pressure regulation, uh, modulation of the immune system, nervous system function, uh, redox, uh, cellular redox uh, state controls, uh, intestinal uh, calcium and phosphate absorption, and as well as, again, bone metabolism. Hypercalcemia causes an increased neuronal membrane permeability to sodium ions, and this allows the easy initiation of action potentials. So, this in turn leads to tetany. So, when the extracellular fluid concentration of calcium ions goes below normal, the nervous system becomes more excitable because why? Because this causes increased neuronal permeability to sodium ions and this allows what happens is easy permeability sodium ends up causing an easy initiate initiation of action potentials so the peripheral nerve fibers end up become excitable very easily and then they become they begin to discharge spontaneously and this spontaneous uh, discharge of these impulses then ends up passing to the peripheral skeletal muscles that ends up leading to uh, a tet- uh, tectonic muscle contraction. So hypocalcemia therefore causes tetany in skeletal muscles. Now, the same thing can end up leading to seizures in nervous tissue, in the brain. As I mentioned earlier, vitamin D has a lot of functions. And uh, among some, we see over here that vitamin D has a potent effect to increase calcium absorption from our small intestines. In addition to that, it also plays an important role on bone deposition and bone absorption. Now, the active form of vitamin D is 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol. It has effects on the intestines kidneys, and bones, which allow for the increase of absorption of calcium and and phosphates into the extracellular fluid. As I'd mentioned earlier, parathyroid hormone is produced by the parathyroid glands. So this is an anterior view of your thyroid, and this is a posterior view of the thyroid gland. And as you can see on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, we have these four tiny pea-sized structures. These are the parathyroid glands, right? And these four tiny glands secrete the hormone parathormone. So hypocalcemia causes, uh, hypo, hypocalcemia is a stimulus, it's a trigger for the secretion of parathormone. So uh, an effect of parathormone to increase calcium and phosphate absorption from bone and a rapid effect of parathormone to decrease the secretion of calcium by the kidneys and parathyroid hormone increases the intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphate. What are they saying over here? So when you secrete this hormone, it's going to increase calcium and phosphate absorption from the bone. What's happening is breaking down, we have increased osteoclast activity. Osteoclast activity, it's going to break down the bone matrix. As the bone matrix is being broken down, calcium is being liberated. So what happens? Calcium levels increase. Blood calcium levels increase. Okay. In addition to that, we're saying that this hormone is going to go to the kidneys and it's going to decrease the excretion of calcium by the kidneys. So if you're not, if you're inhibiting the amount of calcium that's being removed from the body through urine production, then it's going to stay inside your body, it's going to stay in blood, but calcium levels will stay high. And then we're saying that this hormone is going to increase the amount of calcium that's being absorbed from our small intestines into blood. So all these three things will increase blood calcium levels. And this is the effects of parathormone, okay, or parathyroid 
hormone. So once again, parathyroid decrease blood calcium level is going to cause the secretion of parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone will go to the intestines and it's going to cause your uh, it's going to cause uh, it's going to cause an increased uh, amount of calcium to be absorbed from the small intestines in the foods you cons we consume. Next thing is that parathyroid hormone will affect the kidneys. It's going to prevent the amount of calcium that's been excreted by the kidneys. So in other words, we're talking about we're going to absorb more calcium in blood back into the kidneys. Also, this which will also increase blood calcium level. Then parathyroid hormone is going to go to the bones and it's going to cause it's going to increase the osteoclast activity. Osteoclast will start breaking down that bone matrix to liberate the calcium, which is going to cause an increase in blood calcium levels. All right, that's what calcitonin is doing. I'm sorry, that's what parathy uh, parathyroid hormone is doing. Cal uh, calcitonin has the opposite effects, right? So, um, so what's the stimulus? The stimulus of calcitonin secretion is going to be the opposite. It's going to be an increased extracellular fluid uh, calcium ion concentration, right? So we have high concentrations of, uh, of calcium. That's the stimulus for the secretion of calcitonin. So calcitonin is a peptide hormone that's secreted by the thyroid gland. Right? Parathormone, we said, was a, a secretion by which? We, we said that it was secretion by the parathyroid gland. So now we're looking at calcitonin. Calcitonin gets secreted by the thyroid gland. Okay, and it's a peptide hormone, and this will decrease blood calcium concentrations. Right? Um, calcitonin gets produced in by the parafollicular cells. Another term for them are the C cells, which we find uh, being situated in the interstitial fluids between the follicles of the thyroid glands. All right, now we're going to be talking about osteoporosis. So osteoporosis. Um, this is when we have uh, a problem in the bone matrix, all right? So osteoporosis is one of the most common uh, bone disorders that we see in adults, especially in older adults. Uh, osteoporosis, uh, in osteoporosis, the osteoblastic activity in the bone is usually less than normal. Remember, what do we say about this? Osteoblasts, they build bone matrix. So if the bone building activity is low, then what's going to happen? We're not going to have very strong bones, right? The bone's going to be weak. So, um, again, low osteoblastic activity ends up leading to low rates of osteoid deposition. Right? So, uh, if we look over here, this is a normal healthy bone, and this is uh, a bone where the uh, individual is suffering from osteoporosis. So, what happens? Very, very weak bone, very brittle uh, structure. Bones break easily. You can have a fracture very easily in osteoporosis. Now, there's many common causes of osteoporosis, right? Uh, among them, there could be a lack of physical uh, stress on the bones. Because you're sitting down, you're not doing anything. Lack of physical activity. So it's important to move. It's important to exercise. Uh, if you're not going to go and do any uh, strength, you know, uh, strength building uh, muscle building activity, strength training activity. Walking is excellent also, hard impact walk. Go walk for 30, 40, 40, 40 minutes a day. It's excellent activity. Um, so again, we need to have physical stress on the, bo on the bone. This will result in uh, building stronger bones. Next thing we talk about diet. Right? Malnutrition also plays a role in bone, uh, in the building of, of bone matrix. Look, if you're not getting proper nutrition, you're not giving your body the building blocks that it needs to build bone, then bone is going to be weak. Amongst them is also so, uh, vitamin D. Not getting enough vitamin D, not getting enough calcium, also even lack of vitamin C. Hormones also play a role. So in postmenopausal women, a lack of estrogen secretion ends up being another factor um, because it, it leads to a decrease in the number of 
uh, and, and activity of uh, the osteoclasts. Old age, okay? Old age. This is uh, when growth hormone okay, and growth factors start to decrease. And this is normal. So again, too much or having, uh, that happening too fast is another trigger for that. So um, abnormal causes, so old age, again, this is a normal part of life. However, when you have hormonal interplays, uh, or again, um, sometimes it may not even be hormonal, it may be due to other factors, perhaps certain medications that you're taking. This can also lead to problems uh, such as osteoporosis, one of them being Cushing syndrome. So um, large quantities of glucocorticosteroids uh, can also lead to this as well, can lead to Cushing syndrome. So what ends up happening is Cushing uh, ends up causing a decreased deposition of proteins throughout the body, and this can increase the breakdown of proteins, and that ends up having effects on depressing osteoblast activity as well. All right, so what ends up happening? Osteoclast activity is high, bones start getting broken down, similar to what we see over here. Okay, um, now there are certain now, let's talk about uh, risk factors. So certain things we can change and certain things that we're not able to change. So, for example, we can't change our gender. Women, unfortunately, are at a higher, have a higher uh, incidence of osteoporosis. Age, we can't change our age. We tend to see this more in older individuals. We tend to see this more in, in people over the age of 50. Body size. Okay, can also be a factor for osteoporosis. People that are very excessively large, very much overweight, or on the opposite extreme as well, may have risk. Uh, again, we may not be able to change this. Ethnicity, we cannot change. Our family history, we're not able to change either. Um, what can we change? Well, we can change our diet, right? We can increase the amount of vitamin D and calcium that we're taking in. We can eliminate... Uh, taking certain medications, such as glucocorticoids, we can start becoming more active, we can start exercising, we can start to lift weights, do some weight training uh, to help decrease uh, our risk factors for osteoporosis. In addition to staying away and eliminating completely smoking, cigarettes, and alcohol from our diet, from our lifestyle. All right. Can men develop osteoporosis? So, as I mentioned in the previous slide, women seem to have a higher predisposition to uh, osteoporosis. However, that doesn't mean that men can get it either, okay? Men are also at a risk for osteoporosis. So again, there's a min again the, the, mis the, the misconception uh, that osteoporosis is a women's disease. Probably it came from the fact that women uh, are Women tend to see it earlier on in their life. They tend to see it, women tend to see it typically in their 50s. Whereas this is the time right around menopause. Men, on the other hand, tend to see osteoporosis in the 70s. Now, uh, also, uh, we tend to see this um, osteoporosis again. There could be a family history of osteoporosis as well. All right? Now, um, during youth, it's very important to have uh, good nutrition, right? So when you're growing up as children, into your teenage years, into your early uh, 20s, it's very important to have uh, a good nutrition. It's very important to have a high intake of calcium and vitamin D. Why? During this time, we're having the buildup, the deposition of bones. Women, Remember, when women get pregnant and you're going to be, uh, again, you're, you're growing that fetus in your body, what's happening is that baby's taking all the, 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 the calcium from the bone, all right? So, again, it's robbing the mother's body, the fetus is robbing the mother of the calcium. Now, if you don't have a good nutrition, if you don't have good uh, reserves of calcium in your body, then you're going to be left with very little. And moving on. During uh, pregnancy, if you're not taking in a good 
uh, you're not having good nutrition during pregnancy, you're not getting enough calcium during pregnancy, again, you're going to be having problems later on in life. In your 50s, you're going to have a problem with, you may have a problem with, uh, such as osteoporosis. So, uh, during nursing, you're breastfeeding, again, it's extremely important to, for nutrition. So nutrition for women is extremely important. Now, rickets, this is caused by vitamin D deficiency. Rickets occurs mainly in children. This is softening and weaken, weakening of bones that we see in children. And this is usually because, uh, because of an extreme and prolonged vitamin D deficiency. Right. So this results from calcium or phosphate deficiency in the extracellular fluid. And this, the reason for that is because there's not enough vitamin D. So plasma concentrations of calcium and phosphates decrease in rickets. This ends up leading to what? Weak bones. And during prolonged rickets, we end up seeing this marked by an increase in uh, parathyroid hormone secretion. This causes extreme osteoclastic uh, absorption of the bone, and bone's breaking down, and this turns the bone more and more weak. So osteoblasts, they produce large quantities of osteoids, right? And this doesn't become calcified because what? There's not enough vitamin D. Insufficient vitamin D is gonna to lead to insufficient calcium and phosphate of ions, right? So again, bone, and the bone doesn't harden up, right? So, um, and you can see over here, what do we have? We see a, a, a bowing of the bones. Okay, they end up taking a bow, uh, bowed shape over here. So in the United States, uh, one of the things that uh, the frameworks that they set, set up over there to prevent this from happening, because remember, rickets are seen in children. Uh, in the United States, uh, schools, they have either reduced, priced, or free breakfast and lunch. So again, based on your family's income, children from um, uh, preschool all the way to the end of high school either get discounted or free breakfast and lunch. Now, what's included within the, with the breakfast and lunch is milk. And in the milk in the United States, all over the United States, the milk, they end up fortifying it with, they, in other words, fortifying means they add vitamin D to the milk. So again, what does milk have? Milk has high amounts of calcium. So when the children are consuming, they're drinking this milk, they're getting their vitamin D and calcium. Okay, for at least the first, uh, again, from uh, preschool all the way to the end of high school. Osteomalacia, we can think of that as um, rickets in adults. All right, now adults, don't usually have a serious dietary deficiency of vitamin D or calcium. Why? Because we don't really need it as much as children do. Children, remember, they're growing, they're getting taller, the body's building, the muscles are increasing. They need more calcium. However, you know, when this it does happen in adults, deficiencies of both vitamin D and calcium uh, can result due to steroria. Okay. Cetera means failure to absorb fat. Now, vitamin D is fat soluble, and calcium tends to form um, tends to form insoluble soaps with fat. So, therefore, steria, uh, in steria, we have both vitamin D and calcium that ends up getting uh, passed on into feces. We end up pooping it away. So, under these conditions, adults they end up with poor calcium and phosphate absorption. And again, this is what we call adult rickett. And again, this can come with bone disability as well. Okay, in some cases, severe bone disability. Now, osteoarthritis, this is a very common joint disease that we see in adults all over the world. All right, now, um, exogenous or again, um, uh, exogenous means relating to or developed from external factors. So, uh, osteoarthritis could result from uh, trauma, right? Macro traumas. It could be result from repetitive micro traumas. It could result from 
being overweight. It could result from uh, joint surgery, resective joint surgery. It could result from lifestyle factors also, such as consumption of alcohol and tobacco. Now, things we cannot change, things we cannot do, endogenous factors include age. Once you get old, we cannot change that. And again, osteoarthritis, we tend to see this in older individuals. We cannot change our sex. We cannot change the genetic predisposition or our um, ethnic origins. Uh, we tend to see this more in, in Europeans. And again, we tend to see this most in, in postmenopausal uh, women. So these things are endogenous. We cannot change it. So persons that are suffering from knee osteoarthritis, they often complain of limited movement uh, and pain when they start moving. And, and one of the most common places is knee. So when they start to walk. In advanced cases, they may even complain of that pain even when they're sleeping, okay, when they're not or in other words, you have permanent pain, nocturnal or permanent knee pain. Now, some of the major elements that are used for evaluation diagnostic, first of all, again, we look at the history, right? You take a, a, a good uh, history. Then we look at, we do the physical examination. Then we move on to imaging studies. And then also we can do lab testing. All right. Osteoarthritis isn't a curable disease at this point in time. The things that bring it about, uh, about again, um, and, and progresses, we don't still understand too well. So what's the goal of osteoarthritis? It's to treat the signs and symptoms. In other words, we want to put a Band-Aid on it. Uh, we want to slow down its progression. So. What's the therapy that's uh, involved with it? So we encourage physical therapy. We encourage AIDS, arthrosis, uh, perhaps certain type of shoes, certain types of exercises, okay? perhaps pool, going into swimming pools. Uh, medications also are used. And yes, unfortunately, um, surgery, rehabilitation and surgery is also uh, may be used. I'm not a big proponent of surgery. You know, if you go to a surgeon, they're just going to want to cut and, and do the surgery. That's their job. That's all they understand. Um, prevention is excellent, okay? Living a healthy lifestyle, an active lifestyle, exercising, eating good nutrition, abstaining from these risk factors will work wonders for many people. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll help a lot. Again, as I said, as we looked at in the previous slide, these endogenous factors we cannot control. Okay, hereditary ethnicity we can't control that. But then again, as I said, uh, if you stay away from smoking, you stay away from alcohol consumption, you you, you know you live an active, healthy lifestyle, you eat a good diet, then the incidents are going to be much, much, much lower. Okay, so always keep those things in mind. Now, when we look at, okay. Fractures could be of two types, okay? Fractures could be even open or they could be closed. When we're talking about an open fracture, we're talking about skin breaking and the bone coming out. So bone is coming outside of the skin. That's an open fracture. A closed fracture is what we're looking at over here in this picture. The bone's break broken. However, the bone is not coming outside of the skin, okay? So that is a closed fracture. We can look at pathologic fractures. This happens when there's could be a very mild or again minimal force fracture okay however part of the bone that breaks it could be affected by another type of disorder like osteoporosis or cancer or there could be an infection or okay, that's a fracture. in other words uh, some underlying condition led uh, some underlying condition made it the the, the bone to break prematurely. It could be looked at as that, okay? So mild or minimal force ended up fracturing the bone due to another disorder that uh, the bone may have had. Now stress fracture, this results from repetitive applications of could be moderate force. So you may see this in very long distances or maybe you see this in soldiers uh, carry a very heavy equipment. 25 kilos or 50 pounds, 
70 pounds or over a long distance. They're carrying a very heavy load. And, you know, over the course of time, again, uh, bone ends up becoming damaged by this uh, micro trauma uh, from this force. And it happens over and over again. And over a period of time, uh, it ends up breaking cases, stress fracture. All right, if you look over here, healing, okay. So bone heals at various rates. And what are some of these factors? It could be age, it could be other disorders. So another thing that we look at, for example, again, when we're talking about age, children will heal much, much faster than adults will. Okay, adults take much longer to, to heal and to recover. Um, disorders that impair peripheral circulation, so now we're talking about uh, blood vessel disorders, so vascular diseases, or even diabetes can slow down healing. Okay? Now, healing involves, uh, of, uh, well, we have three main steps. Inflammatory repetitive remodeling. Well, let's look at that. So what we have over here is this. We have a bone, and a bone is broken. Now, if you look over here, you see that, again, in blood vessels, it penetrates the bone, and then it starts to traverse inside. So when a bone breaks, the blood vessel is also breaking. And as that blood vessel breaks, what happens? Well, you've got broken bone, and now you've got a broken blood vessel. That broken blood vessel is going to start leaking. Blood starts to leak. We end up having a hematoma that forms. Right? Blood pulls up over here. That's this hematoma. And during this point, we have this inflammatory stage that's happening. A lot of uh, blood vessels and blood factors that are coming uh, to the area where the trauma has occurred. Okay, now we move on into this uh, reparative stage over here, and over here at this reparative stage, now what, what's happening is as this hematoma formed and the blood clotted, now we have uh, this collagen network that's starting to build up over here. In others, we have this callus that starts to form, this bony callus that's starting to form over here. As well as, as, well as uh, the repair of blood vessels that's taking place. We have angiogenesis taking place over here. So um, as we move along from this uh, first stage, this hematoma formation, to the second, this callus formation, now we're going on to this third stage, this callus formation, which starts to harden up. What we're seeing now is that this is no longer uh, cartilaginous. This cartilaginous framework now is turning hard. Now, in other words, we're having, what do we have? We're having um, osteoblasts that are starting to deposit these osteoids, and then this starts to turn into osteocytes. This is what's happening over here. Okay? So once this happens, now we go into the fourth stage, this remodeling stage. And at this point, this original cartilaginous uh, tissue that was present over here is completely gone. And this irregularity, it's been chewed up. Why? Because we, have these, we had a lot of osteoclast activity that came and broke down this bone matrix uh, uh, of that cast that was there. So in other words, now we've got bone that's been repaired, and it is stronger than the original bone, believe it or not. This is how good the repair has been. And this is referred to as remodeling also. Okay, so remember, we said that bone gets remodeled all the time, even when it's not broken. But when it does, uh, when it, when it does break... Uh, the repair that gets done is very strong, that it's stronger than the existing bone that's there, that's running, because it's brand new. Okay. So, um, this is all that we have for this week. Thank you for joining this lecture. Hopefully, you guys have taken good notes. And again, if you did not take notes, please replay this. Re uh, lecture, listen to it again, and take notes. The vast majority of your test questions will be coming from my narration, not what's written on the slide, but what I've been narrating, what I've been telling you, what I've been describing through my voice. So keep that in mind. Not everything that uh, is written on these slides is, has been spoken, and most likely the words that I spoke, the information that I, that I spoke, the, the extra information, is what will be on the exams. All right, so um, thank you again.